Today we continue the series on the Holy Spirit. God is here. And He is the Holy Spirit. And as I have gone the last several weeks with the three questions, the first question is, who is the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. He is a person. He has emotions. He has feelings. He has opinions. Where is the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is here and now on this earth. This is his time. This is his place in history and in time. And he has a purpose. And what is that purpose? His purpose is to lead us to Christ Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. He's also to empower us to witness. He also teaches us and comforts us. And today we're going to be talking about also the principle that he sanctifies and he cleanses us. Romans chapter 15, excuse me, and verse 16 says, He gave me the priestly duty, this is Paul speaking, of preaching or proclaiming the gospel of God so that Gentiles might become an offering acceptable to God, sanctified by the Holy Spirit, cleaned, if you will. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 11, again, Paul says, But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and by the Spirit of our God. Now we know that Jesus told the disciples, I will make you fishers of men. Now, the first thing you think of is fishing. And there's some fishermen out here, I'm sure. Some guys that love and enjoy fishermen. I'm I'm sort of an enigma when it comes to fishing because I love to fish, but I, I just don't like to eat them. I fish for other people to eat them. But there are fish that we catch, and we enjoy going out and fishing them, fishing for fish. But when it comes to what Christ has told us to do, he's told us to go out and to to catch them. But when we catch the fish, who's responsible for cleaning them? Now, if you've ever gone out with a first-time fisherman, especially if she is of the female persuasion... And that fish comes on the line, the first thing she's going to do goes, eh, you know, I do, you know, it's like she catches the fish, and the next job is for her to stay away from it, you know, as it's wiggling on the line. Also, there's a lot of Christians that are like that when it comes to salvation. Somebody gets saved, they come in the church, and we don't know what to do with them, so we feel that we should clean them, even when we want, we, we don't want anything to do with their ickiness. And the Lord sometimes has to deal with me about this same issue. I see people coming, they don't look like me, they don't act like me, they don't sound like me, and I tend to think, well, you must not be anything like me at all. But it's not my job to clean the fish. Amen? So, when we catch them, who's responsible for cleaning them? It is the cleaning process that causes the problem in so many churches. There's this old story about a guy that He's a Christian, and he's, he's at work, and these old big, tough co-workers are with him. They find out he's a Christian, and they start, you know, messing with him. Sort of like, you know, what people do to a, to a London guard. You know, they dance around, and because they know he's not going to do anything. Christians are supposed to be people that are gentle, kind people. The guy walks up to him and says, hey, you big jerk, you know, and, and he just starts calling him all kind of names, and the Christian just looking at him and not responding. And finally, the guy just takes it a little too far, rears back and punches the, the Christian right in the nose. And when he does this, the Christian just pulled out a haymaker of a fist and just swung and just beat the daylights out of that guy. The sinner gets up, dusts himself off, wipes his face off and says, I thought you were sanctified. He said, I thought I was too. <laughs> Pardon the pun here, but... Cleaning fish is a dicey process. Now, when you think of that, you see this this fillet knife. This is a rough process of the fishing guilt. 
is that when you have to clean the fish, if you ever go out deep sea fishing, on the way back in from the, the fishing grounds offshore, the deckhands clean your fish on the way in. That's wonderful. Because then you get to enjoy the fish. You don't have to get your hands all bloody and all, all what goes through all the process of cleaning. But here's the deal. When you, when you learn to give the cleaning part to the Holy Spirit, it's not that bad. When you learn to have the patience of the Holy Spirit, because that's what he's having with people that need to be cleaned. Let him do that cleaning. And the Lord will clean you also. He will take you and he'll make you, make you look the way you're supposed to. He'll make you think the way you're supposed to. There are things that I've seen when people have been saved that they've dropped and put down. I thought, well, I don't know why they've stopped doing that or why they did. You know, but there's a conviction inside of them. And what it is is the, it is the fillet knife of the Holy Spirit carving things away that that person doesn't need to have. And the Holy Spirit begins to clean people and to to spruce them up into His likeness so that the Holy Spirit can present them to God, a sinner saved by God's wonderful grace. There have been times that I've walked up to people that were fishing off of a bridge, and I walk up and I just want to to spark up a conversation. I say, what are you fishing for? And what do they usually answer? Whatever's biting, they'll say. Because you never know what's on the end of that line. And whatever's on that end of that line, that guy's probably going to eat. Now, I wouldn't do that. There's a lot of things that I've caught in ponds and rivers and in bays and in oceans. that There's no way I would ever eat anything like that. But if you're fortunate sometimes, you can catch a really nice fish. If you guys could put Matt's picture up right quick. Matthew was 10 years old. He came to this church with us. He went to the, to, to the fishing uh, retreat that the Unity of the Brethren puts out. And he got very, very fortunate. And that is a 30-inch, 8-pound uh, uh, speckled trout that he caught in Matagorda Bay. That was a, I think it still is a bay record, but it, it is a water body record, but it was a, a junior state record for 10 years. Someone actually beat it this year. Yeah, well, that's okay. He's still champion, you know. But, but if you're fortunate, I'll put it back up, put it back up. If you're fortunate, you'll get a beautiful fish like this that... The way that fish is there and what the trophy looks like are two completely different things. Man could not match the beauty of that fish. Because right along his back, there's this rainbow kind of hue. that It's it's like one of those kind of cars that no matter how you look at it, it changes colors. But a, a beautiful fish that man couldn't match. It looks gray on the wall. But you might might catch a beautiful, wonderful fish like that that tastes wonderful and is terrific. Or, next image, guys. You could catch a frogfish. I began thinking, if Matt would have caught the state record frogfish, I'd have been just as proud because it's a state record. I don't care what it is, if it's a croaker, choker, frogfish, or, or dogfish. It doesn't matter. It would have been a state record. I'd have been thrilled. But we don't always catch the most desirable fish. And you might not have the most desirable people in your life that are saved. Or that, that, that call upon the name of God. But you need to let the Lord be the one that is cleaning those people that God puts in your lives. Because God cleans in His way and in His time. Your job is not to get in the way of the Lord cleaning His own fish. You be patient. You be loving. You, you, you prefer your brother in love, as the Bible tells us to do. And let the Lord... Do the cleaning. There was a time Ron and I, we went out fishing. Yeah, yeah, she went fishing with me for a while. And we, we went up into this little creek area. You remember that, hunt At, at uh, what was that, Stillhouse Hollow. And we, we, we drove this little boat up in there, and, and I, we were just fishing for whatever was biting. It didn't matter. And this five-pound catfish, who caught it? Was it me or you, sweetie? I don't remember. Do you think it was probably? It probably was me. <laughs> I got this five-pound yellow cat on the line in, 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 a, in a little slough that, that wasn't as wide as this platform and pulled that thing in. I was just so excited about that big old fish and took it back and called one of my friends because I didn't really know what to do you know, with a knife and a five-pound catfish. So I took my handy-dandy knife here, which actually this is Brother Fred's. I took my knife, and I began going through. He warned me. He says, very sharp, so I'm going to be very careful, all right? But I took that knife, and, and I was looking at my friend that I asked to help me. And this, this guy that helped me, he's a Yankee, okay? He's from up north. And, uh, but I, I don't know. They have fish up there, too. I thought he might know what he was doing. 
He thought I knew what I was doing. And both of us are sitting there with knives. And we're, and I, I, was, I, was, I began cutting on the fish because it was mine. And as I began cutting on the fish, I didn't lift my head up, but I cut my eyes over to him to see if I was doing it right. You ever done that before? Right? You don't want to admit I don't know what I'm doing. But, you know, I just began cutting. I looked over at him and he had his knife on the other end. And he looked, he started cutting too, but I looked at his eyes. He wasn't lifting his head up either, and he was cutting his eyes to me. And I knew at that moment we were in big trouble because neither one of us knew what to do with a knife and a five-pound catfish. By the time we finished cleaning that catfish, I think I harvested about three catfish nuggets about that size out of five pounds of meat because we didn't know what we were doing. I should have got somebody there that was good and knew what they were doing, and I would have got the most out of that catfish. Well, you know what? When people get hurt in church, when they become scarred in church because they don't dress the way they should, they don't look the way they should, they don't talk the way they should, and we think that they should do this and this and this and this, ahead of what the Holy Spirit's timetable is on that person. You don't know their history. You don't know what they grew up with. And you probably don't know that you probably have more grace given to you than that person has at the beginning of their life. And sometimes we get impatient. Ron and I have have experienced this, where we have gone into a church, sat down in somebody else's pew. Yeah, we had them come up and let us know we were sitting in their pew. We need to be patient. We need to be loving. Keep the fillet knife in your pocket and realize that it belongs to to the Holy Spirit. As this knife doesn't belong to me, the fillet knife doesn't belong to you. The Bible tells us to work out your own salvation with fear and with trembling, with great respect. Let's allow the Lord God to clean the fish and let's put our knives away. A lot of times people, they don't survive a human cleaning. I heard it said at the revival, it said the reason most people aren't in church is because people that are in church and that is true. The Holy Spirit is the one that convicts of sin, and it is the Holy Spirit that sanctifies the Christian, the one who is one. Let me give you an example of the Lord's sanctifying power and his convicting power. And by the way, if you say, well, I don't ever feel conviction, you need to get closer to God, my friend. You need to get closer to God. You want to get close to the fire, you're going to feel some heat. Look at look with me in Ephesians chapter 4 and 29. I'm almost finished. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs that it may benefit those who listen you feel the burn this is the Holy Spirit's work in each and every one of us he convicts us and tells us what is right and what is wrong and when we think we're not doing anything wrong at all That's when we need to get a little bit closer to the Lord. I do as Carol was saying, in the calm, listen to what God is speaking and saying to you. Listen to what he is convicting you of. He deals with every Christian as an individual the same way he saved you as an individual. He ministers, he heals, he fillets, he cleans. And takes the things that we don't need and that are, that are dangerous, not only to us, but to others. And begins to try to remove them out of our lives. Your and my job is simply to yield and say, you know what, I don't need that. Anything that is destructive in your life, you don't need it. It's not essential in your life, in your personality, and in your friends. Let the Holy Spirit do his work. Yield to his cleansing power and let God do it. I know a lot of people say, well, I don't want to get too legalistic, preacher. I don't think legalism is our problem in this current climate. Amen? I think we've gone way, 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 way on the other side of legalism. We have lost our ears to hear what the Holy Spirit is telling the church today. We need to just yield to God, wait on Him in His presence, and say, Father, speak to me. Instead of resisting that conviction. Instead of trying to find a reason why that is not in style anymore or that's old fashioned, stop, listen, and yield to the Holy Spirit. 
If there's something in your heart and life that He wants out, then for goodness sakes, get it out. Allow the Holy Spirit to pull it out because when He does, He'll do it gently and carefully. And Christians, while that person is under surgery, just be quiet. Just be still and let the Lord do His work. When folks in this church have surgery, often I'll ask, how long do they say the surgery is going to be? I'm just curious, you know. And sometimes they'll say, oh, they're, they're say 45 minutes, you know, hour and a half. And then sometimes they'll say, this could be about a six-hour surgery. Whew. You know the last thing I'm going to do? The last thing I'm going to do is go in there and look over those surgeons' shoulders and say, hey, you know what? I think you should do it this way. You know, I don't know. You, know, you, were, you went to school and everything, but I've got some other ideas to give you. I let the surgeons do their work. I turn them over to God, and as a matter of fact, I pray for them that God will lead their hands and guide them in what the Lord has prepared them to do. My job is to be quiet, to pray, and to comfort. And this is what we should do when other people come into our congregation or into your lives or in your work. And they do things different than you do. This is a scripture that continually comes back when I hear people criticize ministries or they criticize other people. And I'm going to tell you, there's some churches and congregations that I would, wouldn't be interested in going because they're not really geared or built for me as a person and my personality. There's some congregations that are looking for a specific set, a really narrow set of certain kinds of people. Okay? More power to you. If that's what God is telling you to do, go and do it. But what they don't need is my criticism. They don't need my judgment. I'm going to let the Lord do what he's going to do. Amen? The disciples came to Jesus and they said, Lord, there are some people over there and they're preaching your, your word. And they're praying for people. And they're doing it different from the way we're doing it. Now, I understand that. Because if I'm Peter, I'm going to think, I'm with Jesus. And they're not. And they're doing it different than Jesus is doing it. And we're with him. What does Jesus say? Jesus didn't go, yeah, right? What's wrong with those nutcases? I can't believe that. That is so odd and, and wrong. It's just weird. No. Jesus says, hey, leave them alone. In other words, let the, let the Spirit's work take place. He said, if they're not against me, they are for me. And what this teaches me is to be patient with my brother no matter where they are in their Christian walk, to be patient. Because my job is not to clean. My job is not to fillet. My job is to love and to pray for people. So, let's pray. Bow your heads with me and let's go to the Lord. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that you would give us the patience of the Holy Spirit. You're here right now. This is your time. And one of the things that you are doing, Lord, we agree that you are cleaning those that have been saved. You're washing them. You're walking with them. You are talking with them. And Father, I know the truth, and I will share the truth, but the responsibility for cleaning and sanctification belongs to you. So God, instead of criticizing my brother or sister, I'm going to pray for them. I'm going to be patient with them. I'm going to be what you were to me, patient and loving. And Lord, I'm going to intercede for them that your best would be accomplished in their lives. And Father, if there's anybody here today and they look at someone else and they say, I'm not where they are and I don't think I can ever get there. I pray, Lord, that they'll realize that you're always on the job working together for their good. Cleansing them and preparing them for good works. Encourage them, God. Help them overcome the sin that does so easily beset them. And I pray for your grace to cover them, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ. God's children said, Amen. Now stand with me, please. I want you to speak a blessing.